place to live eternally Streets of gold and walls of jasper Walk beside the crystal sea I wander so aimless, my life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. Now 
now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. life has grown I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars of Sloan now this morning? Everybody had to warm up a little bit, didn't we? A little chilly, a little rainy. But God's love's always warm, all right? So many preachers, so many churches and denominations got their opinions and their documents and statements and beliefs. Sometimes there's a miscommunication and we complicate the truth and we convolute the story. But as far as I recall, I do believe it all comes down to a man down on a cross saving the world. Rising from the dead, doing what he said he would do. Loving every one of you when he said and done it all. Comes down to a man dying on a cross, saving the world. It isn't a secret, maybe I'm being simple minded, but it's about Jesus. And the way, the truth, the life that can change your heart and soul forever. And we need to be reminded that it's the power of the blood that brings us to redemption. We can rise above the fall, and the reason for it all comes down to a man dying on a cross in the world. Rising from the dead, doing what he said he would do. Loving number one is something. When it's said and done, it all comes down to a man down on a cross, saving the world. And all the people beneath the steeple are just reaching, searching for the truth that can save a helpless soul. Yeah, we wrestle with the mystery and the preaching, but the news is all good. When it's said and done, it all comes down to a man dying on a cross, saving the world. Saving the world. Saving the
What a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from. Okay, kiddos, it's time to go up for Children's Church. That's fourth grade through sixth, all the way up the steps, and they'll be ready for you up there. Everybody else stand up and greet your neighbor this morning. Tell him you're glad to see him. Red it, 
Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is old. Time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely over to thy kingdom, dear Lord, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Ready, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Daily walking close to thee. Equipment malfunction. Sorry about that, guys. Good morning. I know everyone can read, but just to help you out a little bit, I'm going to do a quick rundown of the Christmas schedule around here. And if I mess it up, it really means you need to check the bulletin. Okay, tomorrow night, Monday night's the ladies' Christmas party here. Then coming on Thursday is the kids' program. You don't want to miss that. They've been working really hard on that. So Thursday night, kids' Christmas program. Then next Sunday will be Country Christmas here at Cowboy Church. You won't want to miss that at 930. And then Christmas Eve, we have Christmas Eve service. And then Christmas Day, regularly scheduled church at 8 o'clock at Gravel Hill and 930 here. So that's quickly the rundown so you guys don't miss anything. But really, you need to look at your bulletin because I'm, you know, fallible. Just saying. So this morning, we finally reached that third week of Advent, which is going to be the love candle. For those of you that third week of Advent means we're really, really close to Christmas, so you might want to go to the stores now. I went the other day. It is scary. But so the love candle is a candle that we would light today on this third week of Advent. So I was thinking, what about love? What is love? So I decided to ask people that really know. And so I found where a group of professionals ask five-year-olds what love is. And y'all want to know what five-year-olds think what love is, don't you? Yeah, you do, because I'm, yeah, mm hmm One little boy said, love was when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy, and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. Mm-hmm. Don't think they're not watching you. Mm-hmm. Then one little girl said, love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Then love, one little boy Love is when mommy sees daddy all smelly and sweaty and still says he's handsomer than Brad Pitt. <laughs> yeah. And then the last little girl I read, she said, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. What is it that we hear when we stop opening presents and we listen? Jeremiah says that he, God, loved us with an everlasting love. The psalmist tells us that the Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Then the Romans tells us that who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Neither angels nor demons can separate us from the love of Christ. Not death or life. Neither the present nor the future will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That is what we hear when we stop opening presents and we sit and we listen. We hear the love of God pounding in our hearts. Oftentimes we can wonder, why in the world does he love us? Okay, I'm looking around and we're, yeah, yeah, really. Why does he love us? Because we've made a mess 
of things here. And oftentimes we're like kids. We act just like children. And what happens is, is we're like kids who God gives us toys. He gives us gifts and then we break them and then we demand for more. But then sometimes God tells us, just like we would um, tell our kids, don't touch that stove. Don't do that. That's going to hurt you. But we touch the stove anyways, and then we get burnt, and then we scream and yell at God because we did what he told us not to, and now it's a mess and it hurts. But yet God still loves us when we do those things. We turn our backs on him, and yet he still loves us with that steadfast love. The love of God is hard to comprehend because it's not how we love. But yet we can learn to love like Christ. So God's love, as hard as it is to comprehend, he looked down, saw all this, the despair, the hopelessness, the messes we've made with our lives. He saw it and then he demonstrated his love for us. He didn't just write it in scripture. He didn't just say, okay, I'm going to tell you, like send you a card and say, I love you. No, God demonstrated his love. And this is what 1 John says. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his one and only son as a sacrifice for us. Hmm. God's love. That's what we hear when we sit in the quiet. We stop all the shopping. We stop all the busyness. And we sit and hear his love. And then when we love, truly love like Christ, we are sharing Christ with the world. So this week and the next two weeks, may we go and and live in his love, but then love like he loves. Let us pray. Father, this morning, I am amazed by your love. Lord, day in and day out, no matter what mess I make, no matter what mistake I make, Lord, you still love. No matter what's going on in the world around me, Lord, you still love me. And Lord, we are thankful for that love. In the midst of the chaos and the turmoil and the persecution, Father, you are still loving. So, Father, I pray that we would be a people that would sit in the quiet and hear your love. Amen. In this time of desperation All we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe We believe God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death, we believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing. And in our weakness and temptation. We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, that He's given us new life, we believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death, we believe and he's coming back again we believe we 
Let the lost be found and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade, let the church live loud. Now God will say we believe, we believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail for the power of God has torn the veil. Now we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe. Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death, we believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. Then he's coming back again. We believe. We believe. In this time of desperation. All we know is doubt and fear. There is only one foundation. We believe. We believe. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in In the spirit of that song, every week we, uh, we gather before we do anything else and we pray for our lives as believers in a nation, in a world that definitely and desperately needs to hear about the kingdom called heaven. So join me and let us pray. Father, we come to you, O oh Lord, and we're so thankful. We're so thankful that you're a living God and a loving God, that you're a trustworthy God, and what you say is true and what you promise comes true, O oh God. That's just who you are. But, Lord, we're so amazed that you call us your children, your family, and your body, and we give you thanks for that. Now, Holy Spirit, let us live our lives. Let us allow you to build our lives. Let us allow you to strengthen and mature our lives on that firm foundation that you are love and you love us. And, Father, from that love, then let us, your body, love the world around us. Those that are just like us and kind and gracious, Lord, Lord, let us love them. Those that aren't at all like us, Lord, those that disdain us, Lord, those that, that, that hate us, those that call us their enemies, Lord, let us love them. Let us love those that are of the same race and of the same religion, O oh Lord. But let us love those of a different race and of a different religion, O oh Lord, let us love them. Let us love the weak and the strong. Let us love the holy and the sinful. And let us love them, Lord, like you love them. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Me, oh my. Kind of feel like maybe we just ought to call it quits right here so I don't mess anything up. Has it been good this morning? Amen. Mm-hmm. Gosh, as, as Danae so wonderfully reminded us, we are in the Christmas season. And, and for many of us, not only is it a busy season, but it's a joyous season. It's a, it's a time of families and gatherings and presents and gifts. And it's a time of coming together and, and just enjoying the, the wonderful things of this season. But unfortunately, this I know. 
That is, that is the story for so many of us, hopefully even the majority of us. In reality, that's not the story for everybody. For all of us don't love this season. Matter of fact, all of us aren't looking forward to this season. Some of you are already dreading this season and, and, and realizing that this season's not going to be a time of joy for you. It's not going to be a time of peace for you. It's not going to be a time of family for you. It's not going to be a time of gathering together and feeling warm and fuzzy and cozy and all the things that we like to feel that, that this is a season that you dread. For indeed, this is a season that, that your heart is, is stirred and your heart is, is just wishing. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one through death and this will be the first Christmas. Or maybe it's been the, a lot of Christmases without them. But, but this season is just such a stark reminder that they are not here. Or maybe some of you have lost somebody that promised to love you and to never leave you and to, to be your bride or to be your groom forever. But the promise they made, they didn't keep the promise, my friend. And now this season, you're alone, not of your choice, but forced upon you. You're alone, and it's just a tough season. Some of you in the midst of this season haven't lost a relationship, but you've lost a job or you've lost your health, and it's just not the same this year. And my friend, if any of these things or others are stirring your heart right now, then I'm telling you that this service is for you. I love that, I love that old saying that says, anyone can sing on a clear day at noon, but give me a song I can sing at the midnight. Amen? Give me a song I can sing in the darkness. Give me a song in the midst of a time of the valley of the shadow of death. I can still sing that song. And today, we've come and you open up this book. This is a book that can give us that song, that can give us that comfort, that can give us that strength. And I'm glad you're here. The Holy Spirit is glad you're here. And he's come to minister all of us in a wonderful way. So let me read, if I might, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, looking at verse 3 through about 6 or so. And then I'm going to jump down to verse 8 and and read a little bit more, but you listen. If you don't hear what I say, this is the Word of God. My words can be enhanced by God, but they're not the Word of God. I'm telling you, the Word alone will be sufficient, but I think God wants to do even more in addition to that. So you listen as I read and listen as I preach. First, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, jumping down to verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which, would came, uh, of our comfort which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from the great, uh, great death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. This morning, I want to speak about a God that comes today to offer to give us the comfort that we need in the trial called life. I want to talk about the God of comfort that comes to us in the valley that doesn't merely let us get in the valley, allow us to get in the valley, but goes into the valley with us and leads us through that valley that can get us to the other side. I want to talk about the God that is the deliverer, that did deliver, that is delivering and will deliver us from those sorrows of life, from those night seasons of life, in those tough times of life, if this is speaking to your heart, God's got something to say. Words of hope, words of help, words of surety that can change your life, my friend. Are we ready? Here we go. We have a source of comfort. Who is that comfort for and what are we to do with that comfort that we find? Those are the three things I want to speak about. First of all, we have a source for comfort. Now, sorrow is no stranger to any of us. It's something that all of us experience in some shape, form, or fashion at some time or season in our life. But what we do in the midst of that comfort and the midst of that sorrow is what makes the difference. We can run to many different places trying to find a, a place to find to be around a people, to do to certain activities that will help relieve the sorrow that's in our life. We can go and, and do certain activities and think if I can just do so much of this or so much of that that somehow or another I will, I will snuff out that old sorrow that's yelling at me and that's, that's calling at me. We can find ourselves going to certain things, whether it be drugs or alcohol or you name the things that, that aren't moral, that aren't healthy, and just somehow just try to deaden the pain that old sorrow has in our life. But my friends, today I want to remind you that there is a place and a person in which we can find comfort. 
Not that God can't ever use some of those things to help in comfort, but none of those are the source of comfort. In verse 3, it says it like this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. Oh, my friend, we got a Father of mercy. Whenever you're in the midst of that sorrowful time, of that dark season, of that night season of life, I'm here to tell you that, that we've got a God that says it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how often you've done it. It doesn't matter any sin that you might have done, any stumble that you might have made, whatever you might have done, that there's mercy to be found by me, that there's mercy to be given to you. I've got mercies that are brand new for you every morning. I've got mercy mercies that are without end. I've got mercies that if you were to stack them to the heavens, they would keep on going. They go high up into the heavenlies. I've got mercies that I delight to give to you. Now, some of you today in the midst of that sorrow season, that night season, you're thinking, oh, Jim, but, but how can I come to God after what I've done? I'm telling you, we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace in mercy in our Lord. Grace and mercy. He's the father of mercies, my friend. So whenever Satan is trying to hold you back and push you back and say, don't go to God, the Holy Spirit's here this morning say, you run to God and he's running to you. With arms wide open, he's waiting. And whenever you get in his presence, here's what he's going to say. Welcome home, my child. Whenever you get in his presence, he's going to say, I don't care about your sin of past or present and future. I just want you in my arms. We've got the father of mercy. Give him a round of applause. Amen, amen, and amen. If you've got it all together, this sermon's not probably for you, but for those of us that don't, man, it fits. We've got the Father of mercy, but not only the Father of mercy, but the Scripture says that we've got the God of all comfort. Mm, not just comfort, but I'm talking about the God of all comfort. Every bit, ounce, iota of comfort that we ever experience, it comes from God. He is the source. We need not look to any other. He is the one that we can run to. He is the God of all comfort. Now, so many times whenever we think of comfort, we think, of, oh, boy, that means I feel real good. That means I'm just smiling all the time. That means I've got a spring in my step. Now, my friend, that's not the, what the word comfort means. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You're going through that valley. Now, I'm telling you, if you've been in the shadow, a shadow of death, my friend, you are getting through that with the Lord. But that doesn't mean you're always smiling. That doesn't mean that you're always happy. That doesn't mean that you always feel real good. But my friend, what God is calling us to do is not try to feel good, but to faith good. To look to him, to, amen, to faith good. There's a big difference between feelings and faith. You need to not always feel good, but you need to get out of that valley, amen? You need strength to get out of that valley. You need help to get out of that valley. And that's what the word comfort means. That, that first part of that word is C-O-M, come, and it means the word with. It means with, and the last part is fort, which we get our word that gum jaw already asleep. All right, the first word is, I'll try to back it up. I'm going to prime your pump. It's C O M come, and it means the word with. But, but the last word is fort, from which we get our word fort. <laughs> it's fort. It's fort. It's strength there. With the fort. You got it, Nancy. Got it. By golly, you failed me on Friday, but you did good today. All right, the, the, uh, they, it's, it's that strength that we have. That's what comfort is. Comfort doesn't always feel that warm, fuzzy feeling. Comfort means I've got God of strength with me. Amen. And I'm, amen. And I'm walking with that God of strength like a fort around me. That's the God that we have. It's interesting whenever God sent us the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, it's expedient that I go away, that I might send another, another, he was saying, just like myself to you. And one of the things that he called this Holy Spirit that he sent, our wonderful Holy Spirit that he sent, our Holy Spirit that moves into our life, the moment we put our faith in Christ Jesus, accepting the love and the forgiveness of God, 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 the Holy Spirit moves into us. Are you with me? And one of the names that God refers to himself at, God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Son, refer to the Holy Spirit as the comforter. Are you with me now? We've got all of the comfort we need, which is our strength to get through the valleys, which is our strength to get through the night season. We've got all the strength that we need the comfort that we need, and the one that gives it to us lives in us. Now, is that cool? 
I mean, that's better than having Bill Gates, you know, live in your house. I mean, that, I mean, you can't beat it. You've got God living in you. There's never a season that you're in that you do not have ample supply of comfort, ample supply of strength to get you through because the God of all strength, the God of all comfort, the God of all hope, the God of all help, he's living in you, my friend. Oh, I'm telling the truth shall set us free. Satan's want to keep us bound up. Satan's want to keep us in despair and depression and in doom. But I'm telling you, the God of all comfort offers us not only comfort, he offers us himself, which is the source of all comfort. Now, here's something that, that I learned to do, and, and I learned to do it most this past summer. I've learned to take the names of the Lord and pray to my God in response to who God is. And, and this past summer, we were, had, had a little spell where we weren't getting any rains. Rick, you remember we got all the crops in and then it just dried up. It just did. And, and God was, I was reading in the book of James and said that, that Elijah was a man of like passions like we were. But yet he prayed. He prayed and God heard his prayer and brought forth the rains. Amen. They brought forth the rain. He, he dried up the rain first, and then he, then he brought forth the rain. And so God just let that spirit jump out at me, and that word jump out at me that, that Jim, I want you to ask me for rain. And so I text our guys. I had a group of guys I text every morning and say, hey, you know, God says that we're men of like passion, and if, if oh, Elijah can call upon God and bring down rain or stop down rain, we can do the same. And so I, I, I text them, and, and some of them laughed. They said, still dry here. It wasn't long. I sent them a video back, and it was raining at my house. I'm serious as a heartbeat now. But, but here's something I learned in that. And whenever I started praying from that point on about the prayer life, about the rain in our lives, I started referring him as the rainmaker. Now, dear rainmaker, here I am today. Lord, I ask you to meet all these needs, but dear rainmaker, you know I'm seeking rain for our dry ground. Rainmaker, you created rain. Rainmaker, you make rain. Rainmaker, you control rain. Now, I'm, you hear what I'm doing? I was constantly reminding me that the God that lived in me, the God that's on my team, the God that's the head of this church and the head of my life and the head of this world, that he is the rainmaker. And if I need rain, I don't go to Channel 12 weather. I go to the God that's over the weather. Amen? And talk to him as who he is. And as I was talking to him about who he is my heart started jumping up and holding on to who he was and where there was once doubt there became a little bit of faith and a little bit of more faith and a little more more faith and before long I was looking out the window videoing on my phone that it was raining matter of fact at gravel hill they gathered together and said Jim you need to pray the not rain prayer we're getting too much rain all of a sudden now if you take that are you with me everybody with me some now I want you to connect this to the comforter that lives in you, dear believer. Can I encourage you to start doing this in the midst of this season? From here through, let's say, the middle of January, fair enough? Every time you pray, will you refer to our God as who he is, the comforter? Whew. I tell you, it's going to make a difference. Number one, we've got to realize who the source of our comfort is and where the source of our comfort comes from. It is in and it comes from our God. Number two is then who's it available to? Is it, is it just available to anybody and everybody? Now, I'm telling you, if all comfort comes from God, that anybody that's ever comforted at any way, at any time, it came from God. But I'm telling you something special. If you're a child of God, there's even more favor with God. I mean, it's just like, uh, it's like my kids. I mean, I've got grandkids, and if they want to come and, and they want to sell something, they can come to my house, and, and I'll buy stuff from them. What kind of guys? I don't have any money today, but anyway. Uh, raise your hand over there, all our crew. All right. All right. So, so I can't. So anyway, they come. But uh, if the neighbors come and want, to, want me to buy candy, want me to buy peanuts, want me to buy canned cheese, want me to buy. Did you ever wonder why we fund all this? Anyway, all right, I'll buy some. Are you with me? But whenever my grandkids come, I buy a bunch. Do you see the difference? So whenever we read these verses, let me read them, realizing that they were written to the church, to the family of God, to the body of Christ. 
They were written in a letter to this to the church of Corinth, but they knew that it would be a circular letter. It would be passed down around by, by many other churches. They did not own Bibles like we own Bibles. They didn't even have it canonized like we have it canonized. Uh, they didn't have the privilege. Most of them had never read the gospel. Some of them, they no doubt had heard the gospel about it, but they never read the gospel. And so Paul knew, and more importantly, the Holy Spirit knew that this would be passed around to all. So listen what he says here, if I can find it. And here this is. It says, uh, it says, the Father who comforts us in all of our tribulation. Comforts us. Now let me pick up down here in verse 8. It says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, or trouble of which uh, came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure. First of all, you've got to be a part of the us to have this. I mean, to have the abundant favor of a child of God. But secondly, here are some qualifications for finding the the comfort of God. First of all, that they were burdened beyond measure. You know, saying sometimes when it rains, it pours. Some of you are here today, and it would be one thing if you just had this one situation, but you've got this situation and that situation and that situation. It's almost beyond measure. Well, my friend, if that is speaking to you, then this is what these verses are for. This is what the comfort is superly available to you about. The fact that we have mer- that we have needs that are beyond measure. Not only that we have needs that are beyond measure, but there are needs that are above strength. The fact that we just say, Lord, I just can't carry it anymore. Lord, I just can't go any farther. Lord, the, the load is too heavy. I, I just can't make it if it's beyond measure. If the load is too heavy, then my friend, I'm here to tell you that, that the comfort that God has is for you. And then there's others, the fact that we despaired so much, even despairing of life, finally came to the point that we said, God, I'm so tired of living. God, I don't want to live here anymore. God, I wanted you to take me to that city called heaven. God, I want to end my life. I don't want any more struggles. I don't want any more trials. Lord, I'm giving up on life. I'm a friend. If any of these are ministering to your heart, then God the Holy Spirit is saying, I've got comfort for you. Strength to get you through. Oh, my friend, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare give up. All the comfort of the Father lives in you. And if you're hurting and despairing and depressed and defeated, living in the darkness, I'm telling you, his strength, his help, his comfort is totally and fully available to you. So where's the source? It's from God. Who's it for? It's for anybody that he offers it to, but especially for those of us that are his. So the third thing is, Jim, how then do we learn to apply it? How long do we learn to access that that comfort that lives within us as believers. You ready? Clocks are ticking. Lunch is cooking. Everybody awake. Poke your neighbor. You need to poke your neighbor. Poke your neighbor. They need poked. How do we access it? Let me share a few things. Number one, we need to cry out to God for comfort. It says this in the book of Psalms. It says, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Now, God does this. God implies this. God tells us that we are going to have days of trouble. Do I have a witness that you've had some trouble in your life? Raise your hand. Yes, if you've got a witness of that. We are going to have trouble in our life. It's a promise that he promises us. But whenever he did, he said, I want you to call on me because I've got some glorifying that I want to do through this situation. I might not have been, might have been the best thing in your life. It might have been my first choice uh, for, for you, but I'm telling you, I've allowed it to come into your life. God couldn't have, God could have chose not for it to happen, but he allowed it to come in. So if you're in the trouble that he promised that you're going to have, why not seek to get the best that you can? Call out to God. Now let me read my favorite one. It comes out of Lamentations 2.9. It says, Arise, Cry out in the night at the beginning of the watches. Pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. My friend, whenever we're in that dark season, we need to learn to cry out till we get to God. Yes. 
I mean, there's a difference between praying a prayer and praying. There's a difference between talking a prayer and crying out a prayer. My friend, like, like a river's flowing, we need to let the tears flow if they will. We need to pray until we get connected to God. Never forget the, back whenever my son Ryan was six years old, he had two little beagles dog, and, and one was named Billy and the other was named Cindy. Uh, Cindy. And they looked like bookends. They were litter mates and they were neat little pups. And anyway, Billy got sick. I mean, really bad sick. And I had a real good idea what it was. And I never take a dog to a vet. I, I just hardly ever. But, but there's, there's Ryan. And he's saying, you got to do something about Billy. So I called him to our vet. And I go in there. And he said, man, I hate to tell you, Jim, but he's got Parvo. He said, there's just not much we can do for Parvo. And I knew that. And Ryan looked at, at me. He said, but Daddy, you said God heals Man, you said God heals. And so my little Ryan that used to pray, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. He was saying a prayer before. Six-year-old Ryan cried out to God, God heal Billy. The next morning, Doc Branscombe called to need to come get Billy. He's alive and well. We, we hunted rabbits forever and ever. Now you hold on. Now, you hear me. Some of you have been complaining to God about your problems, Amen. venting to God about your problems, talking to God about your problem. Whenever you leave that conversation, you left just like you came in. But my friend, God, the Holy Spirit is saying, cry out. Let the tears flow. Let every emotion you have come unglued if they have to. But you don't leave till you get me. And if you don't get me in this prayer time, you come back at noon when you get a break. You come back at break time when you get a break. You keep crying out till you and I get together. Amen? Till we get together. It doesn't mean that he's going to remove you from that valley, but he's gonna, you're going to find him in the midst of that valley. It doesn't mean that the circumstances always get better. They might stay the same, but you'll have him in the midst of those circumstances and my friend whenever you've got him you have enough Amen. you've got enough we've got to learn to cry out cry out till you get to him I've seen it a zillion times in my life and the life of others that things didn't even, they didn't even change many times they do but they didn't even change but once they got to this place in the presence of God the peace of God caught up with them so if you're here today don't you dare give up don't you dare give up. You go looking, you go crying, you go searching, you go knocking under the door till the door opens up and the God of all comforts answers you with his presence. Amen. With his wonderful presence. We need to not only cry out to the God of comfort, but we need to cry out specifically in particular areas for him to comfort and strengthen us. And uh, going back to the definition that comfort means with strength or, or with a fort, this kind of helps me. It kind of helps me get a visual. Because God says that, that I, will, I will be like a fort around you. I'm the God of, that's a fortress. I'm the God of all the protection that a, a fortress can bring. And, and Scripture says it like this. David says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. David says in Psalm 31, he says, Bow down to your ear to me. Deliver me speedily, O God. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. So you have the connection with God as our comfort, but that comfort means he's like a fortress around us. Now, what's a fortress to do that's around us? It's to keep the things that can harm us away from us. It's to keep us safe within him. Got the picture? Got the picture over here? All right, that's the keep. All right. So God's got this fortress that's always around us. But, but here's what's bad. He's got the fortress of his word, the fortress of his promises, the fortress of his presence, the fortress of his power. All of those things are around us, and, and we're safe within. But, but you know what we do? We come back here, and we open this back door. We say, it'll be all right if you come in. I know you're not saying the same thing God is saying, but it'll be all right if you come in. It'll be all right if you have that thought or that conversation. We've got to learn to do three things. We've got to learn, first of all, to, to keep the thoughts that are not of God out of our hearts and out of our lives. 
And God's ways are higher than our ways. God's ways are better than our ways. We've got to learn to, to keep them out of, out of that, to realize that indeed the Bible says it will be transformed by the renewing of our mind. You see, everything that we do will be a result of, the, of what we do as a result of what we think and what we say. What we think and what we say will eventually affect what we do, and what we do will eventually become a habit to the good or a habit to the bad. That's just what it is. But it starts in the easiest way, the best way, the most important way to defeat it is way better back here in the thought life never let these thoughts come in and when they come in don't let them stay in kick them out run them out it says in the book of, I, of, of chronicles it says thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee some right here this very morning all you can think about is is the problems that you've got all that keep flooding your mind and you're meditating upon are the are the problems that you've got my friend I'm here to tell you, we've got to put our mind on higher thoughts and higher ways and throw out the evil and the false ways and the defeating ways. It says like this in the book of Philippians chapter 4. It says, be not anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. See that word, that word thanksgiving? It says, whenever you come with prayers of supplication and prayers of intercession, that, that you come to a place where you finally get to God and say, God, now I'm thanking you for what you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to do it. don't know when you're going to do it. don't know where you're going, but God, I'm thanking you. I'm thankful that you've heard my prayer and you're going to be actively about my prayer. And so it is a prayer of thanksgiving be made known unto God. And when we do, in the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. So first of all, pray, cry out to God. But the next thing is, then if we kick something out, we've got to invite something in. And it goes on and says this. This is finally, my brethren, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these. We need to saturate our mind. We need to fill our mind with the noble things, with the loving things, with the upright things, with the just things, with the, with the praiseworthy things. That's what we need to meditate upon. I've shared it before, but that, that word meditate is an agricultural word. It's one that goes back to cattle. It's like chewing their cud. They would eat some grass. They would chew it on a little while and, and get the juice out of it. They would swallow it. And oh, maybe an hour later, they just kind of bring it back up. And, you know, they chew a little bit more. They get some more juice out of it. They swallow it and bring it up. We need to get the things of God. We get the, the things of truth. We need to get the holy things. We need to put in a new tape in our mind and start playing those things and chew on them. Now, here's what happened to most of us. We've not been chewing on the cut of the Word of God. We've been chewing on an old bone. Amen? An old bone that won't go down. An old bone that, that every time I see them, how you doing? Well, they talk about the same bone they've been chewing on. And you just want to say, just spit it out, amen? Just spit that old bone out of negative thoughts, negative ways, and take in the ways of God and chew on them, my friend. Amen. Their life and their health, their wise and their salvation. Oh, meditate on the holy things. Amen. It's time you quit your thinking, thinking. Start thinking like God, whose ways are higher, whose thoughts are better than our ways. But not only our ways need to change, kicking out what's bad and keeping in what's good, but also our, our words need to change. Uh, we're, we're constantly, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll be talking the lie instead of talking the truth. And sometimes we'll be talking what is true, but, but we're, we're talking it in a sense of, of we're more afraid. I mean, just think of some of the statements, and I hear them often. You know, it says, you know, Jim, I, I just don't want to live anymore. I just want to die, but you really don't want to die. I mean, I mean, you're really true. It's not that you really want to die, but what you're saying is, I, I really want to live, but I've been trying to live, and it's not working. And so if life's not working, I guess I'll just take die, dying and death. But you really don't want to lie, die. What you're saying is, I don't believe there's any more hope. I don't believe there's any more help. I really don't want to die, but if I can't find life, well, my friend, we need to start speaking the fact that even though I feel like I want to die, I've got the God of life living in me. Speak those words. It's okay if you talk about how you feel, but end it with a faith statement of faith that is real to you. Speak the truth out. 
Uh, you know, some people say, well, you can never say anything about any condition. Well, I'm not sick. Well, you know, you're coughing, you're, you know, everything all over. You really are. But, but you can say, you know what, right now I'm sick, but I got the hell God of health living in me. I've got the Jesus that died on the cross that bore my sins and, and by his stripes I am healed. He's my great physician. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Talk the truth. Don't just talk the problem. Talk the hero of our faith, the comfort of your life, the strength for your life. Talk the things of our Lord. It makes all the difference in the world. We say all too often that we need to uh, just can't bear it anymore. But God says he'll never put anything on us that we cannot bear. Uh, you know, it, it kind of gets you to a crossroads. Somebody's lying in this conversation. <laughs> you know, now it might be God. Or it just might be you. I, I kind of think if I'm going to put my money, I'm going to put all my money on God. And I'm telling you, there's a liar in the group. It ain't God. All right? You just take that and take it for what it's worth. You've got to get the words in us of God. Then speak the words out of us from God. Doesn't mean that you can't acknowledge that there's a health problem. Doesn't mean that you can't acknowledge that, that you're lonely. Doesn't mean that you can't acknowledge that. But you speak the word of God that finishes that story, like Paul Harvey story used to say, and the rest of the story. Don't forget the rest of the story. Don't just talk at the trash talk. Talk the heaven talk. Talk the help talk. Talk the hope talk. Talk the Jesus talk. Come out of your mouth. As you speak, you will become. We've talked ourselves into the trap. We've talked ourselves into ill health, into bad finance. We've put ourselves there by the words of our mouth. He said, Jim, I don't believe that. That proves it. How's it going in your life? Come on, brother, testify. How are things going in your life with your testifying? I'm going to put my money on Jesus. How about you? Amen. He's the God of all comfort. He's a God that can help. If we got the God that can help, he's got the God that's the strength. Our mind needs to think like he thinks and throw out every thought that tries to get into his fortress around us, every thought that doesn't line up with his. And let the words of our mouth line up with what he has said, what he has done. We need to speak what we believe. It's all right that you don't believe everything. I love that one prayer of the man in the gospel. He says, I believe, Lord, but help now my unbelief. Now, God, this is where I am. Lord, you know I'm not here yet. But, but here's how I like to end that for me. I've got so many things that God has promised that I'm not quite there yet. And so I'll do it something like this. Now, God, I know that you promised that you could do this and you could do that, Lord. Now, Lord, you know that I'm not there yet, but, Lord, will you help me to get there? Will you grow up my faith? Mm hmm What we think, what we speak. The last thing is who we're with. We need to learn to surround ourselves with the right people. It, uh, it, uh, it amazes me. Some people, they can meet a total stranger on an elevator and tell them everything that's going on in their life. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen people like that? I mean, they just come up to you and they just blab everything. They don't know if I'm a gossip. They don't know if I'm a newscaster and they might be on Channel 12 News. I mean, I mean they don't have a clue who I am, but they just, they just got diarrhea of the mouth. They just let her flow. I mean, just every, everything that's going on that's bad, how bad everything is. They just tell everybody, you need to find a friend, not just a warm body. You need to find a friend, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Amen. You desperately need a friend. This is what the Bible says about a friend. It says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But, one, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Proverbs says a friend loves at all times, and a brother, he's born for adversity. Now, I'm not going to say that you're going to have many friends, but I'm telling you, if you can just find one. I said, well, Jim, I can't find one. Well, if you can't find one, there's spiritual principles that given it shall be given unto you. You seek to become one to another. I promise you, if you seek to become a friend to another, God will reward you with a friend back. God wants you to have a friend more than you need a friend and want a friend. Cry out to God specifically, oh, Lord, give me a friend. Let them be praying people. People that are in connection with God. People that can go to heaven 
on your behalf. I, I've, got, I've got four friends that are just, just really three friends, three or four, whatever, that uh, the four of us that, that are together. One's Jason, Jason Forby. Good to see you, Jason. And, and, but one's Jason Forby that pastors at Goreville. One is uh, Steve Stafford that pastors at Joplin. The other's Terry Guyler that pastors at, uh, at St. James. And here's usually what I do. When I'm in, I'm, I'm, there's sometimes I know I've got to pray through, but there's sometimes I know the battle is bigger than me. And so I'll just text them, desperately in need of your prayers, thanks. I don't tell them one thing about what's going on. Satan's not getting any free publicity from me. Amen? They don't need to know my business. They just need to go to the God of over all my business and go with me to help. And they'll check back in, praying. The next day, still praying, hope things are going better, praying. Now, my friend, I've found victory where there would have been defeat. I promise you, I found victory where there would have been defeat had I not had a positive praying friend. If you don't have one, seek one and get one. If you've got a bad associate, don't make them your friend, okay? If you've got a gossip, do not make them your friend, okay? If you've got one that's not a believer and not uh, wise, do not make them your friend. Are you hearing anything I'm trying to say? You need a friend, but make certain you get a good one. No friend's better than a bad one. <laughs> Amen. So we need. So we need to learn to do that. They need to be a praying friend. They need to be a positive friend. You've already figured out all the things that are going wrong. I mean, whenever you get news that's not good news or something bad going on in your life, don't you always think the worst? You don't need somebody negative saying this is what's going to happen. It's going to get so bad. It's going to get worse. Or, man, I had a friend like that once. He died two days later. He never did come back. You know, I mean, I don't need any of those. I need a positive friend. I need a positive friend that says, you know what, brother, you're going to make it. You've got the God of all comfort living in you. I believe you're going to succeed because God, I know the plans that God has for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you, to give you a hope and a good future. I, I know you're God. And you're not thinking you're doing very good, but I'm from the outside looking in. I see some steps you're making, brother. You're going the right direction. I know you stumble, but you're getting back up, my friend. And I'm going to be here cheering you on and helping you on. Oh, it makes all the difference in the world whenever you've got a positive, cheerleading friend. Whew. Amen. A friend. I shared this story on Thursday or Tuesday. I get my sermons messed up. Katie used to run track, and she used to run the, the half mile, and she was good at what she did. But I always knew where she needed my cheerleading the most. It wasn't the first lap. She was fine. It was, it was the second lap. After you've come around the, the second curve, you're on the back straightaway just getting ready to go into it. And, and being a runner, I knew when you got there that you're going, oh, man, I just don't think I can make it. Now, here's what I'd do. I didn't go, run, Katie, you're going to make it. Run, Katie, you're going to make it. No, every time I was planted there and I had one voice, it was the same voice, run to win, run to win, run to win. And it would put wind underneath her sails. It wasn't her voice that was trying to say, you can't make it. She needed another voice that said, you can not only make it, my friend. You can not only survive, my friend, but you can win and you can thrive. Now, we need to speak the truth of God. It's time that we, the people of God, rose up and lived like God and talked like God and thought like God and be friends like God. That's what we need to be, my friend. Oh, they need to be praying friends. They need to be passionate friends. They need, they mean, they need to be positive friends. They need to be passionate friends in the sense that they're for us. They're for us. It says, you who were comforted, comfort others with the comfort that you found in God. That's what a real friend does. He did it for me. Trust me, my brother. He can do it for you. I know this season is not easy for anybody. I'm not saying that it is easy for all of you. It is hard. I'm not saying that it's not like a valley that you're in and that it's, that it's not, that's haunted with shadows and night voices. But I'm here to remind you that the God of all comfort, if you're a believer, lives in you. Though they be immeasurable sorrows, Though they be too heavy to care and that you're desperate even for life. The God of all comfort is there to lead you through that valley. 
it's time you start crying out to that God of comfort. Crying out specifically, oh God, change my thinking, let it be like yours. Oh God, change my words, let them mirror your words. And oh God, bring me help. Mm. Not by chance that you're here today. There was a God of comfort that wanted to make certain that you were here. So he could speak to your heart. So as he has spoke, why don't we just embrace it? Let me pray. Father, we come now this morning, and Lord, I am so thankful that I know all about the free choice and about the fall of man, oh God. And I know that that's how all this old junk got into this world. But God, it, it doesn't really matter that much now, Lord. We're in this world that's under the curse that this world is under. And with it come the valleys and the shortcomings and the night seasons. But Father, with you comes the daylight. Weeping might endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You're the God of all joy and the God of all comfort. You're the God of light. Father, for those today that are in particular struggle, break those chains. Reclaim that fortress that's been weakened and polluted on the inside. Help them not only to cry out, but speak quickly, O oh Lord, speedily answer their prayer for a need of comfort and strength. God, I can't thank you enough for being willing to be our God and the kind of God that you are. Help us to lean on you and to trust in your love and to love you back. And let you lead us, oh God, in ways that we could never find the path by ourselves. So, Lord, this is my prayer. And I pray it in Jesus' name and for his glory and for the good of we, your people. Amen. And amen. God bless you. We're dismissed.